Hello, hello. So, we can all agree on the fact that Napoleon's little spring break in Spain didn't go particularly well. So, today we'll keep on, we'll keep on reviewing Epic History TV and let's focus on Aspern. Supported by our sponsor, Osprey Publishing. In 1809, France, under Napoleon Bonaparte, was the most powerful nation in Europe. But the French Emperor's invasion of Spain and Portugal the previous year had failed to deliver the easy victory he'd expected. And with many of Napoleon's best troops and commanders now tied down in Spain, an old enemy prepared to challenge France once more. Yeah. So here we need to go back in times, just after Austerlitz. Let's talk a bit about Talleyrand. Talleyrand was a diplomatic genius who was known in the French history as a traitor. He was a genius. And he ended up betraying Napoleon when he felt that Napoleon himself was betraying France. Talleyrand was Napoleon's foreign affairs minister. After Austerlitz, he preached for a gentle peace, not humiliating Austria or Russia and even encouraging them to pursue their national projects for Austria to expand in the Danubian area and for Russia to keep on trying to secure its interests in the Black Sea. Instead of that, Napoleon imposed humiliating conditions on Austria, which naturally increased this country's hostility towards France. And the first occasion they're going to declare war on France. Talleyrand saw all of that coming. Austria had been preparing for war with France since her last humiliating defeat at Austerlitz in 1805. Now, with Napoleon busy in Spain, and a British promise of cash subsidies, plus a supporting attack in Northern Europe, it looked like the ideal time to strike. This time, Austria's armies would be led by Archduke Charles, Emperor Francis's younger brother. At 37, he was two years younger than Napoleon, but already had 15 years' experience of high command. The first time we crossed that man's path was during Napoleon's campaign of Italy 15 years ago. At that time, he couldn't do anything because his army was already destroyed. And he was learning from past defeats. He I will quote Napoleon himself. You don't want to fight too often for your enemy will learn from you. Maybe, Napoleon, you should have listened to yourself. He'd begun to reform the Austrian army along French lines, copying Napoleon's corps system and introducing new infantry tactics. In the Napoleonic Wars, infantry fought in close order, packed together, standing shoulder to shoulder. But why present such an easy target for the enemy? First, command and control. Before radios, orders had to be relayed by shouted commands, drums or bugles. Difficult enough in the smoke and din of battle. Almost impossible if troops were scattered. After one or two volleys, you can't see anything on the battlefield. Pair that with the sounds you hear from every part. The, the shots, the screaming of the wounded guys, the artillery. And on top of that, adrenaline is pumping. That's why there were so many cases of friendly fire or even a regiment charging at another allied formation because it's really hard to understand what's going on on the battlefield. Second, firepower. Smoothbore muskets were inaccurate beyond about 80 yards, so volley fire, firing en masse, was the best way to inflict physical and psychological damage on the enemy. Third, morale. Soldiers were much more willing to advance into danger or hold the line if they did so together as a unit, urging each other on. 
we don't understand yet the soldier psyche. It will happen later in the 19th century. And you don't need to understand moral. You don't think in terms of soldier. You think in terms of a mass for individual soldier with its smoothbore musket is not very little and it's not relevant to focus on it. You reason in terms of mass and how to secure this mass cohesion. Fourth, defense against cavalry. Scattered infantry were easy targets for horsemen. Only by sticking together could they fight them off. The basic tactical unit of infantry was the battalion. A French line battalion had, in theory, 840 men, but in practice, nearer five to 600. Our example here has 605 men, a typical strength for a battalion on campaign. The men were divided into six companies, four fusilier companies and two flank companies. On the right, the grenadiers, made up of the tallest, strongest men, often detached to form elite all-grenadier units. And on the left, the voltigeurs, specialist light infantry used for skirmishing in front of the battalion. Skirmishers moved independently, used cover and fired at will to harass and unsettle the enemy, while preventing enemy skirmishers carrying out the same task. Most armies also had specialist light infantry units for this role, such as the British 95th Rifles, French chasseurs à pied, and Austrian and Prussian Jäger battalions. These specialized units relied on soldiers with specific attributes, which were often selected amongst hunters or Jägers, if you will. These are going to be the first one equipped with rifles instead of muskets, as we saw in the previous episode in Spain. Their dispersed formation makes artillery pretty inefficient against them, but they are very vulnerable to cavalry charges. The traditional battlefield formation was the line. All companies formed up alongside each other, three ranks deep. Line formation maximized the number of men who could fire their muskets at the enemy, and limited casualties from artillery fire. But it was extremely vulnerable to cavalry if it could be outflanked. And even for well-drilled troops, it was difficult to keep the line straight while advancing across broken ground. And that's why army drills are more about learning to march together than to shoot precisely as your shot is by nature unprecise. So for maneuver and attack, battalions usually formed a column of divisions. This was a more flexible formation that allowed the battalion to advance quickly though it presented a larger target to enemy guns, firing solid round shot that would tear through several ranks. And it's always a, you know, a rock, paper, scissor thing where one formation is vulnerable to another, but beats another. Line infantry is vulnerable to cavalry. Cavalry is vulnerable to artillery. Line infantry, if they form in square, are vulnerable to artillery, but then Cavalry can do anything about it, and yeah, that's what I find interesting about the warfare of this era. And far fewer men could fire their muskets at the enemy. Theoretically, therefore, the battalion would deploy into line before reaching the enemy. But carrying out this slow maneuver under fire wasn't always possible or sensible. So some commanders kept their men in column relying on momentum to break the enemy line. This was a risky tactic that often worked against raw troops, but led to high casualties when facing better trained infantry, like British redcoats. A column could be closed up quickly to provide protection from cavalry, or if there was time, could form a square. With bayonets fixed, the battalion formed an all-round defence that often resembled more of a rectangle. Enemy cavalry could surround the battalion, but not break in, as horses won't charge a solid wall of men and steel. But an infantry square was extremely vulnerable to artillery fire, and could only move very slowly. 
Changing quickly and smoothly from one formation to another, especially under fire, required training, practice and experience. That is why it is a problem to have so many wars. You need trained officers in order to maintain all this cohesion and articulate this front line. And your officers are by definition in the front line in order to maintain this cohesion and this discipline. So they are very vulnerable. And one thing you cannot easily replace is experience. In 1809, the Austrian army began to use the battalion mass formation. Crude, but more suited to hastily trained conscripts. This was a dense column with limited firepower and huge vulnerability to enemy cannon. But it could quickly close up to repel cavalry, using the same principle as the square, but without the complex drill, and was much more manoeuvrable. Napoleon, warned by his spies that Austria was preparing for war, left Spain and raced back to Paris, arriving on the 24th of January 1809. The French army in Germany, commanded by Marshal Berthier, would need urgent reinforcement. So Napoleon summoned units from Spain, called up young conscripts, and soldiers from his German allies in the Confederation of the Rhine. And calling up more and more young conscripts is problematic because not only the quality of these soldiers will drop, but the discontent of the population increase. People don't like to see their son being sent to the army and never returning home. And the young men who are conscripted don't serve your economy if they are serving in the army, so your economy is going to pay that. Grande Armée was no longer the finely honed instrument of 1805, but with Napoleon at its head, it was still a formidable force. Archduke Charles ordered diversionary attacks in Poland and northern Italy, but launched his main attack against France's ally, Bavaria, on the 10th of April. It came a week earlier than Napoleon had expected, and caught the French Emperor by surprise. Charles was relying on a rapid advance, but a last-minute change of plans, torrential rain and a slow-moving baggage train slowed progress to a crawl. Marshal Berthier was a brilliant chief of staff to Napoleon, but an indecisive field commander. His forces were too widely dispersed, and Marshal Davout's Third Corps was dangerously isolated at Regensburg. Charles ordered his corps to converge and destroy it. But on the 17th of April, Napoleon arrived at Donauwert to take over command. He immediately ordered Davou to withdraw from his exposed position. It was too late for him to escape without a fight. Davout's Third Corps was one of the best in the Grand d'Armée, and in a fast-moving battle across wooded hills, the heroes of Auerstadt threw back the Austrians. Despite the heroism of General Major Liechtenstein, badly wounded, leading his troops forward. Third Corps escaped the encirclement. It starts to sound familiar, and at some point Davou will take it personally that he's always left alone against the whole enemy's army. The Battle of Teugenhausen was the start of Napoleon's so-called four-day campaign. First, he used Marshal Lefebvre's Bavarian 7th Corps and a provisional corps under Marshal Lann to drive a wedge into the Austrian army. Then he pursued its left wing towards Landshut, believing he was following the main Austrian army. French troops and their German allies stormed the town's bridge to win a hard-fought victory. But Napoleon realised that Archduke Charles was not at Landshut, and that, once again, he'd left Marshal Davou to face the main enemy force. Sending Marshal Bessières in pursuit of the Austrian left wing, Napoleon swung north, falling on the Austrian 4th Corps at Ecmu. The French and their German allies won their fourth victory in as many days. 
Napoleon has still speed on these sides. We can give him that. But Charles's main force was still intact, and hoping to keep it so, he ordered a rapid retreat across the Danube. The French pursued, storming the walled city of Regensburg, which they knew as Ratisbon, with its vital stone bridge. Napoleon put Marshal Lann in charge of the assault. When the attack faltered, Lann threatened to lead the next charge in person, and his men, suitably chastised, took the city. During the siege, Napoleon was hit in the foot by a spent bullet, causing widespread alarm, but it proved to be a superficial wound. Stubborn Austrian resistance had allowed Archduke Charles and his army to escape across the Danube. Napoleon had cut the Austrian army in half, but both sections now retreated in good order towards Vienna. Napoleon led his forces in pursuit, detaching Lefebvre's Bavarian corps to deal with a popular revolt in Tyrol, and 3rd corps and the Württemberg 8th corps to guard his line of communications. Charles chose not to defend the capital, which surrendered on the 13th of May, after a short bombardment. That's a big decision to take if you're an Austrian general, but here you see that Napoleon's line is getting thinner and thinner. If you're Archduke Charles and you're fighting on your own soil, your, your supply is kind of secured. And if Napoleon is looking for a decisive battle because he believes that this will knock you out and let him exhaust himself by pursuing him and then fight when you will be confident enough. Instead, Charles and the Austrian army lay in wait across the Danube. Napoleon was now down to 80,000 men, facing 110,000 Austrians. Charles's army had fought bravely and well throughout the campaign. But Napoleon still had a low opinion of Austrian troops, and decided to attack. Even its marshal, I guess we'll see that shortly. On the night of the 20th of May, French engineers hastily built a series of floating bridges between the river islands of the Danube. French troops began to cross. By noon the next day, Napoleon had most of Massena's 4th Corps and his cavalry across the river, about 24,000 men and 40 guns, holding the villages of Aspern and Essling. Napoleon expected the Austrians to retreat once more, and that he'd only face a rearguard. But reports soon arrived that the entire Austrian army was advancing against him in five attack columns, 90,000 men and 300 cannon. The situation got even worse. The Austrians began to float heavy barges and obstacles downriver to smash through the flimsy French bridge. Each time, Napoleon's only supply route was cut off for several hours, causing critical delays to the arrival of reinforcements and ammunition. The battle began around 2.45. It looks like a reverse Friedland now, with the French army taking the role of the Russian this time. PM, as infantry of the Austrian first column attacked Aspern. The village was soon under attack from three sides. General Molitor's French garrison clung on desperately, fighting hand-to-hand -hand in the streets and suffering 50% casualties. 50% casualties is huge for the Napoleonic Wars. For most casualties happen during the campaign with attrition or when a unit routes and you have the pursuit usually initiated by cavalry. But 50% casualties, it sounds like a World War I or even World War II casualty rate. 
To support the defenders of Aspern, Napoleon ordered cavalry to charge the Austrian third column. But they could not break through the Austrian infantry, closed up in their battalion mass formation. At 6pm, Archduke Charles ordered General Bellegarde's second column to take Aspern at any cost. Charles himself rode among the front ranks, urging the men forward. In ferocious fighting, the Austrians took the village. Napoleon immediately sent in newly arrived reinforcements to recapture it. About the same time, the Austrian 4th Column began its attack on the village of Essling, where Marshal Lann had taken charge of defences while he waited for his own corps to cross the Danube. The first Austrian assault was repulsed. The veteran French cavalry commander, General d'Espagne, led his cuirassiers in pursuit, but was hit by grape shot and died of his wounds. Around 9pm, the Austrian 5th Column finally arrived in position, and made its first attack against Essling, which was thrown back by Land's troops. As night fell, firing died out across the battlefield, and men got what rest they could among the dead and the wounded. Overnight, 2nd Corps and the Imperial Guard crossed the Danube to reinforce Napoleon's army, which now numbered 71,000 and 150 guns. But then the bridge broke again, leaving Davout's 3rd Corps still waiting to cross. Yet it sounds like a situation where you need commanders like Davout and its 3rd Corps. Nevertheless, Napoleon decided to attack using 2nd Corps to break the Austrian centre. But first, Aspern would have to be retaken. Heavy fighting broke out in the village before dawn. By 7am, it was back in French hands. At Essling, fresh Austrian attacks were fought off by General Lasalle's cavalry and units of the Young Guard. So the Young Guard is an elite unit. The soldiers are chosen amongst the strongest and the well-educated of the conscripts. They are trained and overseen by people of the old Imperial Guard. And after a certain amount of experience, they have a chance to make it to the old Imperial Guard, so the most prestigious corps in the whole Napoleon's army. With both flanks secure, Napoleon launched his main attack in the centre, with Land's second corps. Austrian guns poured fire into the advancing French ranks. General Saint-Hilaire, leading the attack, a hero of Austerlitz and Jena, had his foot blown off, a wound that proved fatal. Archduke Charles sent his grenadier reserve forward to strengthen the line. The French infantry, under torrential fire, began to fall back. At this critical moment, the French bridge over the Danube was broken again, halting the vital flow of reinforcements and ammunition to Napoleon's army. By 2pm, the French had been driven out of Aspern once more. Heavy fighting continued in Essling, which was briefly captured by the Austrians, then retaken by the Young Guard. Napoleon knew his army could do no more. At 4pm he ordered his exhausted cavalry to make a last charge to keep the enemy at bay, then gave the order to retreat. Archduke Charles, whose own army had suffered huge losses and was low on ammunition, was content to watch the French withdraw to the island of Lobau. In the final moments of the battle, Marshal Lann, one of Napoleon's finest commanders and closest friends, was hit by a cannonball that smashed both his legs. He died of his wounds a week later. And during this long, painful and atrocious agony, 
Lannes implored Napoleon to put an end to all of these wars, which are getting more and more pointless. I guess that's my personal breaking point with Napoleon. If you've seen my previous episodes, I am critical of its actions. I like the guy. I admire his military genius. But I don't worship him. I mean, I'm very proud that he's part of France's history. But I won't shout Vive l'Empereur. He's a ruler. He's responsible for human lives. Lan is maybe the symbol of a talented, devoted man who dies in horrible circumstances like so many other soldiers did for Napoleon. And this does not stop Napoleon or even serve him as a wake-up call to try to cool things down when he still has the upper end. And yeah, I guess that's the moment where I leave Napoleon's side train. And maybe it's a bit ironical because before that you have an incredible amount of soldiers on many sides who, who lose their life during these old wars, but that's my own moment. It was a deep blow to the Emperor. The two-day Battle of aspern essling was Napoleon's first major defeat, caused by his overconfidence and hasty planning. Both sides suffered heavy losses, and Napoleon avoided a much greater disaster only because of the exhaustion of the Austrian army. The French Emperor had learned new respect for the Austrians. Under Archduke Charles they had fought bravely, with greater confidence, organisation and leadership. Within days of his defeat, Napoleon had summoned reinforcements to join him on the Danube, and begun planning his revenge. If you'd like to learn more about... So, I guess that's it for today. Don't hesitate to let me know what you thought of this episode. And see you very soon for the next and last part of the series March of the Eagles. Talk to you very soon, guys. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.